Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christina McHale, and thank you for participating in today's 943rd Justice Clearinghouse webinar. During today's webinar, we're having a panel discussion about the best practices for community policing in order to create a positive impact. Americans' confidence in law enforcement reached a 27-year low in 2020 at 48%. In response, modern law enforcement agencies are proactively working to address this crisis in community confidence, implementing new solutions to reinforce strong relationships, positively impact sentiment, restore trust, and renew respect in authority. During today's webinar, we'll be discussing what various agency leaders are doing to address these challenges. We have an all-star group of panelists for you today. As the Chief Executive Officer for the Police Department, Chief Eric Scott is responsible for the planning, efficient administration, and operation of the Berea, Kentucky Police Department. Major Dan Wise of the Osceola County Sheriff's Office has more than 29 years of experience in law enforcement, including two years with the U.S. Marshal Service. And Sheriff Manuel Gonzalez has served over 24 years in Bernalillo County, New Mexico, in a wide range of divisions and ranks before becoming sheriff in 2009. And rounding out, out the panel, our moderator will be Char Charles Edwards, who will be guiding the discussion for the day. I also want to take a moment to thank our friends and partners for helping with today's webinar. Today's webinar is done in partnership with the National Sheriff's Association and Utility. We truly appreciate working with organizations like the NSA and Utility who are so committed to enhancing and growing the profession. And now briefly, and before we begin, I'd like to share with you some information about the Justice Clearinghouse. The Justice Clearinghouse is the only peer-to-peer -peer educational program for justice professionals that emphasizes the multidisciplinary nature of an effective justice system. Through our year-round virtual conference, our audience and subscribers begin to develop a comprehensive understanding of the justice system while breaking down its many misconceptions. While our events are free to attend live, our subscribers receive 24-7 access to over 900 recorded webinars and are eligible to receive certificates of attendance that can be used when seeking continuing education credits. So if you're not presently a subscriber, I would invite you to join today and support our work. And the last thing I want to address with everybody are some basic housekeeping items. First, this event is being recorded and the formal presentation is scheduled to last about 60 minutes and will be available to subscribers on the Justice Clearinghouse website. Second, this is a listen-only event, but you can type as many questions as you have in the GoToWebinar toolbar. We'll take as many of your questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Next, our speakers have also provided several handouts as part of today's webinar, so don't forget to download those from the GoToWebinar toolbar. And finally, after today's webinar, there will be a follow-up survey, and we do ask that you complete it because your feedback helps us shape everything that we do here at Justice Clearinghouse. And so with that, I'd like to turn our presentation over to our, our panelists for the day. Welcome, gentlemen. Charles, it's all yours. Chris, thank you very much for the introduction and panelists, thank you for being here and to those in the audience, thank you for joining us as well. As Chris mentioned in her introduction, this is a conversation about community policing. So I'd love to start out by talking to all of our panelists about what community policing is from their perspective. Major Wise, let's start with you. When you think about community policing and how you define it for your community, how do you define community policing? Well, that's a very good question, Charles, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I think uh, my panelists would agree that community policing is something different in every community. I think every community has a strategy based on their community needs. Um, from our agency standpoint, you know, community policing starts at the everybody that's involved in community policing, from your road patrol to your every unit, every employee in the agency should be engaged in community policing. Um, from that perspective, we move over towards transparency. I think you know the very core of community policing is transparency within a law enforcement agency. And how do we bridge the gap between our agency and our community? And how we do that is from the deputy from the dispatcher all the way up to the sheriff or the chief or the CEO um, of our agency. Major Wise, thank you. Chief Scott, you heard Major Wise talk about 
everyone needs to be involved. Transparency is key. When you think of your definition for community policing for your community, what stands out to you? So for my community, um, when you look at community policing, it's really the core of getting to know your constituents, getting in the community. Um, you know, a lot of people think of community policing as, as you know, some cliche term, but it truly works. You look at the history of law enforcement, um, we've had a lot of models. I mean, there's been in the militaristic age, there's been, you know, the community policing age, there's been the tactics, there's been all kinds of different styles that we've tried in law enforcement. And I can tell you that the core root of what actually works and what's successful is getting to know the people within your community. And so I know for myself in the city of Berea and in and, and Kentucky, our goal is to get on a personal level. And if you get to where you can empathize with your community's issues and their problems, that's the first way that you can start to solve them. And then what you will find then is that your community is more willing to, to assist and help you in, in obtaining that same goal. And it's not the me factor or he or she factor, it's the we factor. And so our goal in Kentucky and, and in the city of Berea is to get on that personal level, uh, get into our schools, get into our communities, get into our business owners, our, our, um, our clergymen, our, our whether, you know hospitals, and get to know these people on a personal level. And what I've learned, especially going through the trials and tribulations of 2020, um, it was so essential for us to have built those relationships and to have those. So when you do have some type of crisis like COVID or some type of uh, shooting situation or you know some of the, the things that happen across the country, you already have a good foundational uh, foundation set. And I know um, it's the root cause of how we win um, in, in law enforcement and how we bridge those gaps. And so uh, it, it is also a challenge, but I can tell you that we are excited uh, to take on that challenge and to continue to work with our community. Chief Scott, thank you. Sheriff Gonzalez, you heard Chief Scott talk about some of the very current issue, topical reasons why community policing is important. Let's also hear from you when you define community policing for your community within New Mexico, how do you define it? What's important to you? What's important to us, Charles, is that you want to bring law enforcement and the community together. And so for us, we have community-centric policies. And what we also do to reinforce those policies is to make sure that our community-centric operation plan. So we'll, we'll identify people that are catalysts in the community, people that are catalysts in our, in our department, and having those people to work together to solve problems. Another thing that we do to enhance or, or solidify community policing with our agency is that our promotions and our opportunities come in community-based uh, uh, placement. When I say that, is if somebody's looking for a promotion, we have to make sure that they're involved with the community and a lot of things that are trending in terms of problems that exist within our community are involved in the promotional process, they're involved in the evaluations, anything that has to do with an incentive to do something good has to be tied to the community. And that just incentivizes our people to be uh, engaged with the people, understand what's going on. Although sometimes our, our employees or our deputies come from other parts of the country so that they fully understand the culture of, of what's going on uh, specifically in Bernalillo County, which includes Albuquerque. I think one of the most important things we've done is really tailoring our services to be community centric. And when I say that we have on-site community briefings in businesses, uh, neighborhoods, wherever the community needs us, instead of hosting those briefings at a substation, we host them in the community. Another thing we've done to ensure the success of our community-based uh, uh, strategy is also that our, our uh, command staff and line staff attend neighborhood association meetings. We work shoulder to shoulder with the community to solve their problems. Uh, we collaborate with our community stakeholders, whether they're businesses, faith-based groups, uh, educators, whoever needs us, we're, we're there with them. So ultimately, we tailor all our services to the community, and that seems to be a winning strategy for us. Major Wise, I want to pick up on something that Sheriff Gonzalez said and um, Chief Scott said. Uh, Sheriff Gonzalez talked about the importance of bringing law enforcement and community together. And Chief Scott talked about the importance of community policing, especially coming off of 2020. 
So when we talk about relationships from your perspective, Chief Wise, how do you think about the best ways to have strong relationships between your law enforcement department and your community? And Major Wise, I think you may be on mute if you want to take yourself off of mute. I, I apologize. No worries, uh, thank you. Give you a little history about our community. Um, we're kind of in a unique situation where our community uh, over the last 10 years has grown significantly in the Hispanic population. So we're over 65% now um, of the Hispanic population. And uh, you know, I'm very proud to say that our sheriff, uh, Marcos Lopez, was elected as the first Hispanic sheriff in Osceola County in its history um, this past January. Um, so when you look at community policing and some of the things that we do, we have to look like the community um, first and foremost. And so we're making great strides um, to do that. And in order to do that, you know, uh, as an agency, we foster um, incentives and different different things to to make us more aligned with the community that we serve. I think that's the very core of what we need to try to do first as um, a, you know community policing. Um, secondly, the countless programs that we that we host and that we support in the community, um, which I think we'll go over uh, at a later time, is also important. Um, just like the sheriff and the chief had said, all those, to be a part of the community, um, our agency needs to do that on a daily basis. And it starts from the ground up. And like the sheriff makes uh, promotions, part of um, the, to get promoted, you know, you have to be involved in the community and we're the same way. It's very, you know, all of our command staff, we're involved in all the associations, um, the, the business councils, the, the face-based group. I mean, we're constantly engaged in those type of things um, because we can talk about it, but we need to do it. You know, action speaks much louder than words. And if they see us out in the community like that as an agency, that fosters community policing within our agency, because the agency has to believe it first before it can go out into the community. And those are some of the type of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, Chief Scott, Major Wise talked about the demographic changes in his community and wanting to make sure that his agency is reflective and representative of uh, his community. When you think about building relationships within your community, what are the present today challenges that you face when you're trying to connect with the community? So the challenges we face is in, in my city, we are, we have a, and it's an older city. And so uh, a very conservative uh, city It's very political. Uh, and, and we have a college, uh, the Bria College. It was the first college in the country that that taught black and white students together, um, Berea College. And so it, it, we have a lot of challenges in our community sometimes when you look at some of the political things that are brought into your community and some of the challenges. And I think, you know, last year, for instance, we would have a, a Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, protest or, 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 or gathering on, on a Monday and then Tuesday, uh, 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 Blue Lives Matter. And it was almost as if like the town was completely divided and you're either gonna be Blue Lives or you're gonna be Black Lives. And I saw this as the first African-American chief of not only my agency, but in my county. I said, how do we get past looking necessarily at the color and get down to the root cause? Because the reality is, is we all really want the same thing, which is a safe community. We want to be able to raise our kids and provide for them in, in the best way we can and just in, enjoy our version of life, whatever that may be for you. And so we really struggled at first with um, with getting the community, one, uh, to understand me and some of the changes that I was bringing to them. But, you know, I come from Atlanta, uh, uh, wh where you're at, uh, Charles. And and so I have I've grew up in a very diverse home. And then, you know, in college at the University of Kentucky, I, I learned more about it and playing sports and and having, you know, guys on my team from Samoa, guys from, you know, Hispanics all over the world. And so a lot of it was taking a lot of my background and, and, and implementing that and, and coming up with like a team atmosphere. And so something that I do a lot in Berea is I preach teamwork and that 
if we're going to be successful, it's going to take everybody on this team doing their jobs. That doesn't necessarily mean when you leave the, the, the practice facility or the game that like you guys are going to hold hands and go shopping together, right? But it does mean that you have to respect people. And so we really are pushing to get the community to understand that though you may be completely different religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, in your religious belief or political beliefs or whatever it may be, that there's a common ground of respect. And so we really push hard to to get that. And that comes with our officers beating the ground, uh, getting to meet everyone in the community, um, ensuring that as we recruit, we recruit not just for our city, but also the students in our college that are very diverse. They come from all over the world. Uh, Berea College is a free institution. So not only are we getting individuals from all over different uh, economical or, or uh, different colors and backgrounds, but you're also economical statuses as well. And so, you know, it was it's definitely been challenging. And I think 2020 has been challenging for, for most with COVID and the political uh, season that everyone kind of dealt with. But I can tell you that I have learned persistence is all it takes and, and being truthful with your community and, and, and not, you know, warding back from this conversation. Like this is real, this is modern day America. And, and we are all leaders, uh, the major and the sheriff, we are all leaders in communities that we, we don't, we can't run from. And, and the days of law enforcement hiding behind and sitting in their cruisers and, and just doing law enforcement, those days are over. We're, our, our job is, is multifunctional and it's in the community. It's, it's medical, it's, 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 it's political, it's religious, it's all of that. And we have to be able to connect with those individuals at their level. And that's exactly what we're doing. And it starts with recruiting, it starts with attention. And then something else that I've noticed, it starts with retraining. So you can't just assume an officer who's 50 15, 20 years in that they got it. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of issues across the country. A lot of the, the older guys, they almost get lost in translation. Like we have to bring them back in and make sure that they're up to date with the most modern, most up to date things. Because yeah, you, you've done it for a long time, but the, the society changes every day. And I think that's one of the things that we're doing is making sure that we're ready for that. Sheriff Gonzalez, I want to bring you into this part of the conversation in just a moment, but Chief Scott, I want to stay with you just for a second because I think the way you describe the divide is something that a lot of law enforcement agencies tune into this conversation are probably experiencing in their own communities as well. You've talked about wanting to make sure that everyone in the community finds a common ground. Since you've been working on this since 2020, I wonder if there's maybe one example of a moment of a community conversation where you felt like, you know what, I know times are tough right now, but this is a sign of progress. This is, this is a sign that we're moving forward in terms of growth. Is there just an example that you can share about a moment that you feel really good about? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, about a year ago, we had a, one of our female officers, she was a school resource officer, uh, very well connected with the community, uh, a very uh, diverse background, uh, and, and she saw an African-American kid running with a shirt off in, uh, down one of our neighborhood streets. So she pulls up to stop the kid and she says, hey, you know, Darnell, she knows this kid. She's like, why are you running? And he's like, I'm late for an interview. So the kid goes to hop in the car, you know, but our policies are that we have to make sure we pat everyone down before we put them in our vehicles. Um, it's just a safety measure. At that moment, a, a community member uh, pulls up and sees this interaction between a white officer and a black student uh, with the shirt off and he's sweating and, and immediately starts filming. And, 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 and that's when I realized that that's, that's that moment where the officer has an opportunity to either say, hey, get the heck out of here, I'm doing police business, blah, 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 or to take just a second to say, hey, if I'm no, if it's safe to do so, let me see if I can address this, 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 um, this member. Um, and it was very powerful. You know, she turned around and said, hey, I just want you to know I know Darnell and, and, and I love him like he's my own kid and I want to make sure he gets somewhere safe. And I remember the community member at that point, because we were body cameras, they turned their phone off and she said, thank you for that. She says, because I was worried that this could be an incident of an African-American kid running. And this was right after the incident in Georgia where, where the, uh, the gentleman was shot, I think, by somebody with a shotgun or something. They were chasing him through. So it was very it was it was very like fresh on everyone's mind at that time. And I just, and I, and I, and I preach that to my officers, if you can do it safe to do so, take that second just to say, Hey, look, this is actually what's going on. And I remember Darnell turned around and says, it's okay, ma'am. I actually know her. And, and, and this is officer, you know, officer so-and-so. And I remember at that time thinking that's very powerful. And, and it kind of helped me as I move forward, reminding my guys day in and day out. And it's a part of our mission now is that every time you get out with the community member, every time you take a second, and you talk to them about what we're doing, because a lot of times it's just people don't know exactly what we do. 
And that's why our citizen police academies and bringing people in for ride-alongs and getting into our community is so important as, 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 as leaders so that people understand that there's, you know, uh, there, there are the depictions online and then there, there, there's, there's perception of reality. And the, and the, re, the reality is, is we, we try our hardest to make sure that we don't have those incidents that we see blasted all over the news. And I think day-to-day -day operations, 99% of us are doing that and doing a good job at it. Well, Chief Scott, thank you for sharing that story and also the, the impact of that experience. Sheriff Gonzalez, when you hear that, it, it also reminds me of what you talked about in terms of bringing law enforcement in the community to, together, how you're trying to tie promotions to the importance of community policing. I'm curious to know, when you think about all of the relationships you have with your community, is there one that really stands out to you in terms of an example of how you're trying to bring law enforcement and the community together? Absolutely. So one that I can think of off the top of my head is uh, just recently uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic rolled out and we uh, decided, you know, at that point, you know, what were we, was going to change in our services. It didn't even take us a few days and we started uh, working with some of our business uh, uh, people and within our community that we had relationships and we started finding there was a need to get people, whether it was food and or daily essentials, like toilet paper, those type of things. And what we did is we worked all, with all these different business stakeholders throughout our community and basically basically came up with about, and fed about, it, came up, it was about 30,000 meals. And uh, we provided those with the public for, for people that were in hardships, uh, amputees, uh, single parents, uh, different type of people that needed services and, and weren't exactly sure what was going to transpire from the COVID-19. We did this for months. And this relationship not only solidified our, our, our prior relationship with these people, but just re, re, reinforced it because they realized that, you know, we're not just the, the, the enforcement, right? We're not just the stick. We're also the carrot. And when we provide a service, we provide people with the service of, of, of needs, right? So you have people in hardships that were in it, were probably going to be out of work. They were unsure of, of what was going to happen with their families. There were some elderly people that were just afraid to go out because they were afraid and feared for their life because of their underlying health conditions. So the, us having the ability to get uniform officers out to their home, have that relationship, telling them, hey, if there's something else you need, and, and just that trust, and that that difference of service and tr kind of like just being available and being able to adjust your services at any time is a huge thing. So for us, it was another way for us to build credibility and expand that credibility with the public. And and going back to what you started off this whole uh, set webinar with saying the Gallup poll, right, at, at 40 some percent. Well, I venture to say here in our community, we probably have an approval rate of 95 percent. And I say that because of the relationship, the trust, and some of the things we do in modifying our services to be community-centric when it comes to service. Sheriff Gonzalez, thank you for that. Major Wise, I'm curious when you talk about one of the things I've heard you say is, you know, we are trying to make sure we look like the community. We're trying to be entrenched with our community. We've heard examples from Chief Scott and from Sheriff Gonzalez as you think about the past year and, and, and year and a half, is there an example that really stands out to you of, you know, I'm glad that we did this from a community policing perspective because it seems to be paying off and we're, and we're seeing a little bit of progress. Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, to the sheriff's point, um, a big concern in our community, again, was our elderly population. So we teamed up with a program we have here, which I'm sure, you have that program in your um, jurisdiction. It's called Meals on Wheels, where um, volunteers go out and they deliver meals to our seniors that uh, cannot um, help themselves. Um, and during the pandemic, um, they had no volunteers. So our agency redirected our resources to a certain perspective, and we took over that whole Meals on Wheels program for about a year. And we and our deputies on the street, I mean, they delivered meals. I mean, staff delivered meals. Everybody that could possibly do it um, did it to help um, to, to, you know, fill that gap um, that we were missing, that the community 
was crying out to us saying, listen, we need help. Um, in addition to that, we also participated in many food drives and um, we helped different um, businesses, um, partnered with businesses to um, pass out different things because at a, at a certain time during this pandemic, people were very scared and very nervous. So, I mean, we were the, trying to be the common hand and trying to help the businesses uh, do what they can through um, distribution centers and, and the sheriff's office helping out and those type of things. So again, community policing is about, you know, we our agency has a $95 million budget, but I promise you when you talk about police work and fighting crime, our agency spends more time connecting with the community than fighting crime. You know, the chief mentioned, and he's completely right about the, the heavy stick. You know, we don't want to be the heavy stick. You know, we want to be that agency that is with our community. Um, and we had a very similar incident to Chief Scott's with an SRO that gained national attention when one of our white officers was in a confrontation with a um, African-American female at one of our high schools. And he had to take police action and he did a, um, he took her down to the ground and someone was filming it and it went viral. Um, you know, we, a transparency, we immediately addressed it um, and we got in front of it. And because of the relationships we had with our school board and, and that SRO, who is the epitome of community service when it comes to what you want your deputies or your officers to be, it never, it never escalated into something more than the, the one person out of 10,000 that wanted to make it something that it really wasn't. And because of those relationships and because of all those things that you do beforehand, it never got that. Major Wise, I want to stay with you for just a second on the example that you just shared. I can imagine the law enforcement agencies tuned in to this webinar have found themselves in similar positions. You talked about the fact that it did not escalate in a way that we've seen other situations escalate. If you were unpacking this as a case study, for others to learn from, why do you think it didn't escalate in that way? Well, I think because first and foremost, uh, the deputy himself, the SRO in the school was very well known. He was a coach on the team. He was well liked by everybody. He was engaged in the school, not with a heavy stick, but day in and day out, he fostered those children. He knew most of them, like Chief Scott had uh, talked about, where his officer knew that particular student. Um, so, and not only that, from an agency perspective, you know, they immediately started asking about our training. You know, that particular officer and all our SROs have had, you know, all the essential SRO basics, critical um, crisis intervention training, all the things, the mental health um, counseling training our SROs had. So. The training was there, the deputy was there from a community standpoint, his philosophy, the way he policed his school was community based. So, and then the way the command staff handled it and supported him um, was a recipe for the community to say, hey, they're, they're on top of this, you know, and it's because what the video looked like, but that's not what it was. And they trusted their agency. Chief Scott, I just heard Major Wise talk about the amount of money in his budget on an annual basis and where most of that money is spent connecting with the community. Some people may hear an annual budget for a law enforcement agency and think, well, clearly a lot of that money is going to fighting crime. So I'm curious to know from your perspective, community policing is something that is not a new concept. We've known about it for a while. But how has community policing changed or evolved over time to what you see it being today? Well, I can tell you, uh, the great thing about modern day policing is we can stay so well connected with, with our constituents because of technology. And so the day in the age of, um, you know, with some of the older officers in the 60s and 70s and 80s where you're hoofing it on foot, you know your community. Major Weiss is, is, is laughing right there. I'm not, I'm, oh, I'm not trying to talk about anybody in particular, but um, I can tell you that it's, it's powerful. You know, our Facebook presence is huge. 
I mean, uh, we, we, at Christmas, we do snowman competitions and, and the kid with the best snowman, we come out to him and in Kentucky, it snows here, maybe not in Florida or New Mexico, but I can tell you it snows here. And so, you know, we have the ability now to use different, different techniques. And also we've learned a lot in law enforcement, right? When you sit an officer's academy, what they're doing is watching a lot of mistakes from cops before them. And not just that, there's statistical data now that backs what we do. And it proves that, you know what, if you get into your community and know who you're dealing with, it literally, just like Major Y says, when a big incident happens, you necessarily don't have to worry because the community will speak for you and speak for the character of that person. And so I think it's so essential that like, as we look forward, we connect with our community where they're at. I have I look at the analytics of my Facebook page, the Berea Police Department page, and I know exactly who's clicking on that page and watching. We I just allowed one of our PIOs to start a TikTok page. I don't know too much about TikTok, but I can tell you that like he's he's doing awesome on TikTok right now with the community. And so it's it's different age groups. And so what we have to do now is we have to basically look at an array of things that we have accessible to us. And we have to use those things to the best of our abilities. Like the, like I said, the day in the age of just going out in your cruiser and just answering your calls, like that day's over because you're disconnected from the people that you serve. But if you get to them on their level, uh, we do a, a series called Beneath the Badge where every one of my officers, you know, every month we promote an officer, who they are. Like you take this, this uniform off of me. I'm a dad of three daughters. Uh, I'm a coach. Uh, I go to church. Um, I'm a husband to uh, my wife that I've been together with since the eighth grade. Uh, like we're people just like everyone else. And I think that that's the biggest thing that we have to get people to understand that this is a Chick-fil-A uniform. This is a UPS uniform, that this is just the job that I'm doing, but it's not who I am. I am more than this badge and I'm more than this uniform. Um, I love my uniform and I love my badge and, and, and it comes with honor and respect. But I can tell you that it will never outdo the heart that's underneath it. And I think that that's what we need to focus on is the heart of the human and the heart of the people we serve. And if we get to that personal level, there, there's nothing that can stop us as we move forward in law enforcement. You know, Sheriff Gonzalez, Chief Scott just talked about the way that community policing has has evolved in terms of using technology to get beneath the badge or behind the badge. How have you seen community policing evolve in your area? Well, I love what he just said is, uh, you know, what we want to do to both of their points is humanize law enforcement. And I think that's the, the point we try to make here is that we are human beings. The, the uniform doesn't define us, but it, it, we, play a very vital role in people's everyday lives as a, uh, as American citizens, right? By protecting their most sacred things and their birthrights, their property, their lives, and their rights. And so for us, we have to be very conscientious of that, knowing that uh, this is a sacred thing for each individual and that we need to respect that. I think what we can do in terms of evolving in terms of technology and how we get this message out is, you know, we have one of the top five uh, social media pl uh, platforms in the whole country. And I say that because I went to the National Executive Institute for the FBI and they were showing our agency as one of the premier law enforcement agencies when, when it comes to social media. And so we understood at the time when I came into office is that that was an important way for us to communicate with the digital in the digital age with this uh, generation. And so we have all those platforms and we know they're very effective. And what we want to do in law enforcement when it comes to technology is make sure that we're informing the public and making sure that our side of the story and our narrative is being heard and not being uh, generalized by the mainstream media in terms of what's getting out there. Because when that kind of filtering and those type of stories are being out there, it only causes us to either be defensive and or be misperceived. So what we want to do is make sure that our narrative is getting out there and we try to do the best we can with social media. Uh, we do have a team of people that uh, take part in that. But, you know, we have a host of, of other media things that we've had to change over the last several years. And I'm just going to name a few, Charles. One is a, a records management system. Things that we've helped mitigate in terms of uh, pursuits is a star chase system, a GPS system. Uh, we also have a bolo wrap apprehension, which hopefully this de-escalates force in some incidents with people, whether they're mentally ill or they're not cooperative. We have a sheriff's app that 
helps us uh, inform the public or creates resources or helps them understand the resources of the sheriff's office. And then probably one of the things that I'm most proud of that, that I like to share that's probably hopefully gonna change law enforcement forever. We have what we believe is the only real-time digital download uh, system in the whole country from our helicopter. And what, so what that means to us is that we have the ability to do a real-time incident from a helicopter and as you as a person that's sitting wherever you're at in the country and, and, and the major and the chief, I can literally send them a token on their phone right now from our helicopter. And if they're an incident commander, they can view whatever, uh, wherever our helicopter is, whether it's a protest, an active shooter, anywhere in the world, as long as you have that digital device. Nobody else in the country has that that. Uh, technology. We developed that here at the Sheriff's Office. And so we are looking forward to developing that and furthering that with law enforcement. And the other thing that I've seen is that, you know, we've just recently and over the last 17 or 18 months have uh, also got body worn cameras. And so what we've done is not, we've looked at it as a, as a tool to inform the public, uh, create policy, uh, tell our story and use it as a positive way to to represent law enforcement and not so much look at it as a, an issue of trust, but more as a uh, as a tool to communicate uh, better ourselves and uh, and and hopefully educate the this generation and generations to come about what law enforcement does every day in a positive way. Major Wise, you just heard Chief Scott and Sheriff Gonzalez talk about the importance of technology as a tool that they're using to connect with the community. How, how has technology helped you when you're trying to do your community policing? Oh, it, it's helped immensely, Charles. Um, like the sheriff had said, um, you know, I've heard about that program, Sheriff, and uh, from a, a aviation standpoint, that's incredible um, to bring that transparency and especially, you know, tactically wise, a lot of different scenarios. But for us, uh, when Sheriff Lopez took office, um, he understands the importance of social media. Um, make no mistake, I mean, if you're not engaged in it, you're, you're falling behind. And like the sheriff had said, you know, you need to you know, get in front of these type of things. Um, our social media team that we have put together over the last year has done amazing things uh, as far as our community outreach and our Facebook page. We have over 400,000 followers now to our um, Facebook page. Uh, we do creative things like, you know, um, Friday's Most Wanted and all kinds of different community engagements on our Facebook page, TikTok, Instagram, all those things that, um, that become necessary. And that technology makes it easier to reach out to the community because that's what the community is demanding now. No longer can we, uh, you know, put an ad in the paper and they throw it on your front porch and then you read about it, you know, a week later. Uh, so some of the technological things that we're doing is certainly through our social media platforms. Um, we are uh, investing in, you know, body-worn cameras. Every first responder in our agency has a body-worn camera. It costs millions of dollars um, to have that. But it is critically important, like the sheriff had said, to paint a picture. Like we're transferring, this is what our officers are doing. And believe it or not, uh, having body worn cameras reduces complaints and it really shows the true picture of what's happening. And a very small percent of our officers, you know, ever get into trouble with the body worn cameras. So certainly technological advances through our, our web based um, applications on our website you know, tracking sexual predators in your neighborhoods, different things like that to open our agency up, putting our policies and procedures on our agency website so people know that what we're doing, um, neighborhood watches on there, just an array of things, um, technologically speaking, um, to do that. And not only that, Charles, real quick, but just the very core things that we do, our police cars, our mobile data computers, the technology has gotten pretty incredible uh, to make us more efficient and that we can better serve our community. 
You know, Chief Scott, I'm curious. All of you have talked about the benefit of technology, whether it's social media or the actual equipment that you know you all are using on a day-to-day -day basis. Certainly, when it comes to resources and funding, everyone's ability in terms of resources really varies depending on how much resources and funding you have as an agency within your budget. Certainly, technology is important. We've heard you all talk about that, but I'm curious from the perspective of an agency that has all of the want to have those different tools, but maybe not as much resources as they would like. How do you look at community policing from, from, from various different perspectives to say, hey, we may not have the technology we want to do all of these things, but we still know we need to have an impact in the community. How do you offset some of the you know, uh, challenges of not having the resources that you would like? So, <laughs> It's, it's funny because, you know, I hear the sheriff and, and the major talk about their agencies and I'm thinking like, good Lord, those are very large operations. And, and, and I thank them every day for even being able to do stuff like that because I know at, at our level, so $95 million budget for, and I don't even know, know what the sheriff's budget is, but I can tell you that like we're $5 million budget, right? So the reality is, is you, you do what you can, but at the root cause, your community wants to see you. And so though, you know, things like social media, they're free. Um, you know, our body camera systems are very expensive, just like every other, you know, agency uh, in the world. But it's just a percentage of the cost that, you know, ours is, it's 400,000, not millions, right? But I can tell you that there is a there, there is a lot of technology and equipment that we would like to have. But what we've learned is, is that the, at the root cause, our community wants to see our faces. They want to know who we are. And so we do the best with what we have and what we can. And we're, we're, we're seeing that we're just as successful because the reality is if I were to bring a helicopter into my community, they probably would say, how the heck can we afford it? And we would, we would, we would catch a lot of flack for it actually. It would be a negative thing to where in the sheriffs or the majors communities, those are assets that are used, you know? And so I think it's really based off of what your community needs are. And our community needs are just slightly different because, you know, uh, a, a lot of that stuff they see is like flashy or Hollywood. Those are essential to the operations of our, bitty, our bigger city counterparts that are, that are on the call with me. And so I can tell you for myself personally, we do the best we can with what we have, but we're very blessed to be able to say, you know what, with or without technology, we're going to still have the same success with our community because we're going to go knocking door to door and we're going to go beating down their doors and we're going to meet with them in the community. We're going to have coffee with the cop. We have literally an event calendar where I think every 17 days throughout a course of a year, we're involved in doing some event with our community. And then we got to thinking like, if you're in their face that often, there's no way that you can fail because yeah, it'd be nice to say we could do this and do that, but Facebook is great but they want us to come out to the city park and, and shoot a basketball with them. They want us to go through the neighborhood to a neighborhood watch meeting. I loved uh, uh, the sheriff talking about them being a part of the promotional. They love coming. We have our, we have a city council form of government. And when we have our promotions, you know, we have a board come in and it's not just police officers on that board. It's community members. It's our, it's our council. And so they feel very invested into us and we feel as well as into them. And so as our city grows, so does our need to have, more technology and more stuff. But at this time, you know, uh, in a city of 20,000, I don't necessarily have to have a lot of the things that they have. And I think that as long as we can do, get to the same end goal, I think that that's all that matters. Combination of the technology, the resources, but also doing what you can to make sure that the community sees you participating out in the community. Sheriff Absolutely. Gonzalez, I wanted to bring something up that you talked about in the beginning, this idea of the promotions being tied to community-based policing and also tailoring services to the community. One of the things that we've, we've talked about, but I wanna talk about more directly here is the idea of transparency. Uh, from your perspective, what does transparency mean in relation to community policing? Well, to me, it's uh, uh, basically transparency is for us kind of like almost no different than the policies, the practices that we do every single day. And so to be inclusive, like also with the promotional process, I'll tell you other things that we do for transparency. We have a ride along program. Uh, we have press conferences where, where we invite the media and uh, we give them as much information as possible. We have a Sheriff Citizens Academy. 
we have open house events for the public so they can attend and go to cookouts with our deputies and they can provide, you know, have a conversation and get to know our deputies on a first name basis. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, let me, uh, press releases. I'm going to give you an idea. So we, we do some press releases with links from our body worn cameras so people can see some of the incidents our deputies were involved with. That goes a long way with them. Uh, we also provide video footage for on social media of events uh, to promote transparency for for the public and then get a better understanding of things that we uh, uh, are doing. But I think one of the most important things I do as a sheriff is I have an open door policy. And so for us, we're willing to meet whether they're activists, whether they're uh, business people, it's an individual citizen with a concern, and it might just be somebody that wants to drop in and, and have a question. So I think the most important thing we do as heads of agency is that we have to be the best listeners. And, you know, we're not always going to have the right, all the answers, but what we do is probably know how to ask the right questions. And we have uh, competent staff that are are willing to go out there and, and work shoulder to shoulder with these people. And that's what ultimately people are looking at. They're, they don't expect you to solve all their problems, but as long as you're willing to listen to them, go out there and, and, and take a shot at it and uh, get to know them, that's what the whole relationship is about. Trust, transparency. Uh, the transparency uh, is, you know, you can't give everything, right? Because some things you can't compromise in terms of victims because we are a victim-centric uh, department also. And we always want to be very uh, uh, concerned about the way a person's feeling when they're a victim. So, you know, we, there's sometimes we have some conflicts with the media, you know, and uh, they have to be understanding that we're not always going to give them things. And that sometimes that can be used against us. And, and that's sometimes a, a, the unfortunate things that we have to deal as heads of agencies, whether it be me, the chief or the major, and sometimes dealing with these uh, situations, because I can speak for myself uh, for, for almost the last seven years, I'm, I almost had 30 deputy involved shootings and uh, none of them have, have, have had excessive force. They've all been uh, uh, exonerated by a special prosecutor. So we've had no issues in terms of that. And that really bolstered the re relationship with the public knowing that we're forthright and forthcoming with as much information as possible. Major Wise, I want to go to you on the same question here in just a moment, but um, Sheriff Gonzalez, you just mentioned something about that, that, that number there, 30 of those incidents. I imagine for law enforcement agencies tune in to this webcast, that's either something that they have experienced or may experience in the future. How did you navigate that as a head of agency? How did I? Uh, so for me, it's incident by incident, right? So for me, we were facing a crisis because uh, Albuquerque has a one of the biggest crime problems, if not the biggest crime problem in the whole country. And so when the Attorney General of the United States came out to visit with us, I I told them in full, full truth what was going on here, and they sent resources to help assist assist us with some of our issues when it came to violent crime in the metro area and Bernalillo County. And so for us, what we were facing at the time, uh, we had a, probably a string of almost like 10 deputy involved shootings in six months. And just by the sheer numbers, I kind of did the numbers in comparison, comparing our agency to the size of Los Angeles County, which is the largest sheriff's department in the whole country. And I, and I gave the attorney general this illustration of what was going on here. I said, if this would be going on in Los Angeles, this would equate to about 600 shootings in six months. I said, don't you think that's a major problem? I said, you would literally have every uh, media affiliate in the whole country there asking what's going on. And I said, and nobody's asking what's going on here. And I'm telling you what's going on and we need help. So what we were able to do is establish a good, strong relationship with our federal partners and get the assistance we needed so we could mitigate those things. And we were able to uh, modify some of the things we needed to do uh, operations wise. And uh, we were able to turn those things around and we've been able to mitigate a lot of those shootings and get things uh, a handle on them because we're holding violent offenders accountable. And that the emphasis isn't being focused on the officers in the shootings, but more towards the violence towards the community. And that should be where the focus is. And as long as our deputies are doing the right thing uh, and, and doing it constitutionally, uh, then 
they can still be questioned, but they need to be treated justly. And that's all we want is we want justice on both sides of the coin, right? We want justice for law enforcement and we want justice for the community. And that's what it came down for us, came down to for us. Sheriff Gonzalez, thank you for giving us that in-depth look. Major Wise, I want to turn to you now. When we first began this conversation, you talked about transparency right from the jump. So I'm curious, how do you weave in transparency as a part of your community policing aspect? Uh, certainly. So, you know, transparency starts at the top, you know, and unfortunately, I'll give you a quick example, um, is trying to get ahead of things. We had a deputy um, just yesterday that we arrested uh, for um, involving himself in a criminal investigation. Uh, we immediately held a press conference um, to the community um, and were transparent about it. We didn't try to hide it. We, we went out and said this type of behavior is not acceptable. And we explained the circumstances to the media. It was a big press conference. It was on all the local news channels here. Um, but the agency was, I mean, they weren't praised, but we had to make sure that the community knew that we take this seriously and we're not trying to hide it because we could have just not done anything and just arrested them, booked them in jail and not said a word. And they would have found out about it, you know, in other means, but we wanted to get in front of it. Just, you know, like the sheriff, you know, his, his uh, problems are you know, manifested a lot larger than, than ours. Uh, but certainly the same type of tactics, getting out in front of those. As far as transparency goes, again, some of the pr uh, programs that my uh, panelists have said, you know, ride-alongs. We have a, a CARES board that we call that. It's a group of citizens that come in, and we, we provide them information on our policies and procedures, and we ask for their input and recommendations for the sheriff to make. So, you know, making the community feel part of what we're doing. Uh, and we do that again through Citizens Academies, both in Spanish. We have a Spanish Citizens Academy that's 100% Spanish. Um, we just created a program um, to hire um, language, Spanish language interpreters in our dispatch center uh, right now, you know, because we don't have enough Spanish speaking dispatchers. We have uh, interpreters where normally we would have to use the uh, language bank center, and that takes time. Um, but now we're hiring interpreters to sit in our dispatch center that can handle those calls from other languages. Um, so things like that. I mean, we have probably 25 programs, I'm not going to list them all, that expose our agency to transparency every day. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. Uh, Chief Scott, Charles, if I, yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to follow up. I, 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 thank you, Major. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention that was very important during these uh, deputy involved shootings is that we did roll out a a footage for a, like a briefing of the shooting, provided footage for the media and the public, and that seemed to dispel any any kind of like issues with uh, with a controversy and or questions about the shooting, and that seemed to go a long way not only with the public but with the media, and there was no follow up question so. I think if you ever have the opportunity to to kind of do a, a video of the incident and provide it for for the public and the media, it goes it goes a long way. So that would be some of my my advice to whoever's listening. Sheriff Gonzalez, thank you for that. Major Wise, thank you for that as well. Chief Scott, I want to turn to you. You just heard Sheriff Gonzalez talk about you know using the end result of technology towards uh, making sure that there is a transparency piece. For the community major wise has talked about targeted programs based off of demographic changes in his area that help with transparency how do you implement transparency to make sure that you have that aspect when you're looking at community policing the reality is is transparency comes with uh trust and so you, you can do it you can have you know jump around and, and and show the community this but if they don't believe it at their core then you're just really just copying what other agencies are doing and so what we try to do is is make sure that when we sit down with our constituents that like we we talk to them and and so i think it starts with talking with your community it starts with getting to know your community um i think it's so essential so that 
when things happen like 2020 or whatever happens, whether it be an active shooter uh, situation or an officer involved shooter situation, that you already have that that foundation in place. And so like what we do in, in our city is every part of our of our operation is documented in some form or fashion, whether it be Facebook, body cameras, whether it be ride alongs, uh, word of mouth, our city council meeting, we have a special portion where we talk about what's going on in our department. Um, I do community updates uh, through social media and talk about not just things about the bad, but the community cares about like what we're doing with their taxpayers dollars as well. You know, when they see a helicopter in the air or I just recently launched Tesla's, we're in Kentucky, right? We're the first law enforcement department in the state to launch an EV vehicle. Uh, there were a lot of challenges there. A lot of people saw the Tesla as a $100,000 waste of money, right? And now that they realize that, oh, the Model 3, the, the model that we got was only 45,000 and that our Tahoes and Explorers and some of those are 40 to 50,000, right? And yet we've already saved, you know, like six grand this year in, in, in gasoline. A lot of it is just transparency and meeting them where they where they're at and so uh for our community facebook is probably 80 percent of our of, of getting information out to our community but the the rest of it is is is, is knocking on doors talking to the constituents getting into our churches our sports teams um and and letting them know like who we really are um and i think that that if, if we all no matter the scale of our department whether you got you know 10 10 man department or or 20,000 officers it, it doesn't matter the root cause is getting in your getting in people's faces and and making sure that you're persistent but also that you're trustworthy that they believe what you're saying and i think that that's the biggest thing and to get there you have to be disciplined you have to follow your policy procedures and just like major Weiss says when we make mistakes you have to hold our officers accountable just as we would hold anyone else accountable you know you can't have a suspect that gets into a shooting this and it's like you know it's like throw them in cuffs throw them underneath the jail right and then an officer does the same thing we find they're guilty and we don't hold them as accountable right and so we have learned that we tell our officers hey don't put us in the situation but if you do you will be held accountable just like everyone else follow your training follow your heart and know that this job comes with a higher level of expectations you're not just an average person walking around you we are one of the few people on this earth that can take someone's constitutional rights away and that comes with a strong amount of responsibility and so we take that serious in our city and i know these these uh chiefs and, and officers as do as well because the reality is is if we don't focus now in this generation of, of focusing on our communities we're going to continue to lose this battle based on uh, a few agencies throughout the country that may not be following this or a few officers within agencies there's a lot of agencies that are really good agencies that have an officer go rogue and that's when you do exactly like major weiss did you hold them accountable you you you, you get in front of the problem and you tell the people hey look we're human too remember underneath this badge it's Eric Scott, the dad, the this, the that. I get frustrated. You know, my, my nine-year-old runs me around the house. She she rules my, my nest, right? So, like, we are people, too. And so that's what we have to remind everyone is that, you know what? And not only do, are we real people, we're real people who deal with extraordinary, difficult situations at all times. And I think that's the most challenging thing is, is after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years of, of a lot of carnage and bad people's worst days, it's so important that we see that, take care of our officers. And when we notice that they've been through this stuff, we take care of that. Well, Chief Scott and Major Wise and Sheriff Gonzalez, thank you all very much for answering my questions. But we know that we have some audience members who may have questions of their own. And so Thank you all as you've been watching this discussion. If you haven't already, you can chat your question and Chris will ask your question to our esteemed panel here. And if you have already asked your question, now's the time. So Chris, let's open it up. Have we gotten any questions that we've received from the audience for our panel? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Our audience is never shy. So thank you all so much. This was just a compelling and insightful conversation. I really appreciate it. And by the way, I just want to give a quick brief shout out to one of our longtime presenters, Tom Dwarak, and his entire training class is joining us remotely today as well. So I know you all have been sharing a lot of the 
the great messaging and insights and wisdom that he's been preaching for a number of years now. So thank you also for joining us as well, Tom's class. And folks, if you're like me and you liked this webinar, then do be sure to join us on, do be sure to check out our whole lineup of webinars on our law enforcement feature page, where you're gonna find another webinar that I think you might be interested in. So join us on December 8th, when we'll be talking about practicing procedural justice internally to foster its practice externally. So if that webinar is of interest to you or your agency, all you need to do is go to the justiceclearinghouse.com website, go to the navigation button called webinars, and then drop down to law enforcement. So do be sure to take some time, check those out. We'd love to have you join us. And also just as a reminder, folks, don't forget to download the handouts that the speakers have provided for you today. So we do have a number of questions from the audience, gentlemen, if you're ready. Okay, let's get started. Michael asks, what problem that my community, which is a small town population about 1500, has, is not reporting suspicious activities to our dispatch? Me and my marshal, we have been talking about organizing a public event to educate and to, to take general questions, but do you have any ideas on how to get things started? Um, I can follow up on that. We started an initiative, even though we're bigger, but the concepts are kind of the same. And Chief, you could probably chime in. Uh, we started a see something, say something campaign. And uh, we used yard signs and we used all types of things to try to promote the community to see something and say something. Uh, tip lines in um, schools are good. And then of course we have Crime Stoppers, which a lot of uh, agencies have. So those are come, some of the things that we do. I'll, uh, I'll uh, speak on that. We, we do those as well, but something that's been really successful to us is getting into our neighborhood watch programs, right? Um, there's no better uh, uh, community person that knows their neighborhood that a homeowner who's watching any type of uh, criminal activity go on. And I can tell you that what we did was, is we basically, I assigned an officer to each. We break the, we all have districts and zones in our communities. And we basically assign an officer to each of those zones of community and they act as a liaison uh, for that community. And so the community knows like, hey, if there's something suspicious or whatever, I have this officer's phone. I can call them, I can text them. And so we basically tell them, hey, these are the officer's hours and this is when blah, blah, blah. And if not, you know, go through the regular channels of 911 or whatever. But we have seen a huge amount of success because there's so many times people see things and they don't know a, a way to get in touch with us other than 911. And they're like, well, this maybe not is a 911 situation, but it's a serious matter. And so I would encourage you to um, look at your neighborhood watch uh, along with, you know, Crime Stoppers and just being very uh, available. Even though your community is small, everyone in your community is going to have social media in some way. Get on social media and and, and, and make it accessible uh, to them, whether through emails or messagings or whatever, but you have to be responsive to them. Uh, one of the things that we found is we were we had too many social media platforms when I got here. And so I had to narrow it down to where it's just Facebook and Instagram. And then we're slowly implementing one by one as we have now kind of figured out that science because social media is a science. But I would encourage you to meet with your community um, and do like some type of community watch program. And then I think that, that you'll get the real feedback that you're seeking. Sheriff Gonzalez, um, Major, Major Wise talked about see something, say something. Uh, Chief Scott talked about Crime Stoppers Neighborhood Watch. How do you see it from your perspective? Both great, great responses. Uh, we also see the opportunity. We have a tips line where people are able to call in and then we sort those out for their respective units. Uh, that's another approach. Then also, I think from the standpoint of the marshal's question is he may want to develop uh, maybe the policy that uh, obligates the dispatcher to take the information and disperse it to the right individual. So there's some accountability there. Uh, that's another good approach. So yes, he has, that's a great question. And I think it's a, it's a, a, a good way for him to just uh, take that information and maybe figure out how, how to capture it and then and make sure he's get that, the, the dispatchers are getting it where it needs to be in terms of the law enforcement services. Thank you, Chris. We'll throw it back to you for the next question. Perfect. So touching on something that several of you have talked about, what role does the PIO play in community policing? 
I'll, I'll just start off by saying uh, it's one of the most important roles in your police department. They are the face, right? And so, you know, everyone knows your chiefs and your sheriffs and stuff as, as the head, but that day-to-day -day operator is my PIOs. They're the ones that actually are in the streets. They know what's going on and going on in the community. And so it's so essential that your PIO has access and the community has access to them. It, it should, the communication should blow, uh, flow both ways. And so um, uh, for to, to simply answer your question, is it's one of the most important parts of, uh, of a police department. And you have to make sure that your PIO is a person who can connect with people, that they're natural with it, um, and, and they're a person that can connect with a different, uh, a vast number, whether they're they're different generations, older, younger. Um, they have to be kind of hip in, in, in social media nowadays. Uh, a lot of that stuff is super important in making a successful PIO, but uh, they're immensely important to our, our operations as law enforcement. Uh, yes, I also see the public information playing a critical role between being the bridge between the public and law enforcement and also law enforcement into the media. So they have an extremely important role in terms of what's getting disseminated, what's getting put out there, the way it's perceived and how that message is, is taken. So it's very critical that the information is accurate, it's current and it's uh, it's factual. So we want to make sure that the information people are getting, uh, so there's no uh, chances of, of, of fear mongering, the chances of misperception, any type of uh, misinformation that will lead them to believe something's more dangerous or or something's not as dangerous. So the PI was a plays a very critical role in terms of the accuracy of information and how timely it is. Yeah, and really quick uh, to follow up on our panelists. Uh, PIO is very strategic as well on how the branding and your message goes out to the media. Uh, a good PIO can uh, develop relationships with the media and they can be very beneficial um, to navigating the media and getting your, your word out to the community. Uh, something I'll add real quick. Uh, and I'm too, uh, Sheriff, a, a National Academy graduate, uh, 271. So uh, something I learned uh, while there was after the uh, the Mandalay Bay shooting in Las Vegas and how well they managed their social media. And I can tell you that if we have a critical incident in, in our city, I want the public to immediately go to our platforms, right? I don't want them going to our local news stations or our local media or even local friends uh, uh, social media. And so that's why it's so crucial that you build this stuff up now. Like this is why I do so many community activities is because I'm building up followers, our base is growing. And so whenever something does happen, I have the platform to immediately disseminate the most urgent and, 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 and active information that's up to date and accurate. And I think that's what the sheriff and, and the major are talking about is the accuracy in your information so that it's not misconstrued um, uh, third party and not saying anything against the media, but there's no way you're gonna depict the information unless it's coming directly from the horse's mouth. And I think that that's what we're trying to do is to try to build up our platform uh, by using our PIO by being in, in, in being successful so that one day when we have that big incident, immediately everyone comes to us and we can help them through that, whether it be after an incident or currently during an incident as, as Las Vegas was, you know, they had grown their following to millions. And so when that Mandalay Bay shooting had happened, they were able to get messages to the people of where to go, uh, not to go this way and what to do. And I think that's, a, that's, a, that's what we're trying to do here as well. Not to interrupt, but 238, too. <laughs> oh, fantastic. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't point out to the audience who are still with us that we have a number of PIO and social media webinars next year. So do be sure to go check those out on the web on the website later today. Next question, we're going to pivot just a little bit. Um, how would you address training of law enforcement officers with a lot of experience but who are reticent to change. Lauren is asking, there's an ingrained knowledge there that lim sometimes limits what can be done administratively to handle those issues that often have protections by the union as well. So how do you deal with those seasoned officers who just don't necessarily adapt? Chief Scott, I'd love to have you jump into the conversation there because I know you talked previously in an answer about having officers of multiple generations within your 
I'll tell you simply this, uh, weed them out. If you can't modern day police, you need to go find something else to do. Uh, we hold our people accountable to the most modern standards, uh, practices, and policies. Uh, uh, CIT training, which is crisis intervention training. If you're not crisis intervention trained, if you're not up to date with the most uh, uh, um, techniques and tactics, uh, Bola Rap, as the sheriff uh, spoke, uh, those are all really positive tools that we use in our community. And if you're an officer that is so ingrained, it is time to go. And I think that's why um, uh, law enforcement is moving so fast now. Uh, for a while there, it was it was it was it kind of slow and stagnant. But expectations are changing. Technology changes every year, and so shall we. We have to keep up with them. And so I can tell you, as an officer, I when I started at my as the chief of the Bureau Police Department, I had an officer that was 73 years old, and our youngest was 21, which is the age to become an officer. And as you can understand, that the generational gaps. I remember the 73 year old just begging me not to make her wear a hat and don't put me in one of those electric cars and I don't want a computer. But it's like, you know what? I had a conversation with her and she said, you know what? I think it's time for me to retire. And she looked at me and she says, thank you. It's the first time in, in the last 10 years. I should have retired 10 years ago is what she said. But she said, it's the first time someone talked to me about purpose. They talked to me about uh, uh, expectations. And I said, if you can't meet the standards and we do it as professional as we can, but we also have a job to do. And, and I cannot risk the overall public's perception and the brand of our agency because we're, we have an inability to uh, to get through and break through to some of our older officers. But what we can't do is um, not listen to them. They have the experience and the knowledge. And so this it's also twofold to where you don't want to push technology on them so much, but you have to find roles. So whether that be removing them in some capacities and putting them, it's just, it's just managing your team. And I think uh, successful departments have really good leaders at the top that are managing not just their team, but every individual on that team. And just like an athletic team, uh, I'm, I'm an ex-professional athlete in football. I play with the Tennessee Titans. Everyone had a role on that team. It didn't matter if I was the kicker, uh, I was a lineman. I snapped the ball for Vince Young, right? It doesn't matter if I was a center, a kicker, or the quarterback. Everyone has a role, and it's super crucial that as we follow, we, we work towards those goals, that everyone's working in one cohesive group. And I think that that's what's super important. And so, yeah, I dealt, I've i definitely dealt with those challenges, but I think that um, if you work with them either in or out, I think that it's going to definitely help. So can I follow up with that? Sure. Well, first to your credit, Chief, well, your, your Titans beat my Rams this week, so congratulations. Uh, also, I want to say it's absolutely imperative that, that there's two things we need to understand as law enforcement administrators. The top, two top things that we get sued for is failure to train and failure to supervise. So to his point is that we have to hold these people accountable, whether that comes through documentation or what whatever it takes to hold that people accountable. But the thing we need to be very aware of going back a little bit is that we do, again, protect people's most sacred things as individual citizens, right? Their rights, property, and lives. There can't be a compromise in service when it comes to putting somebody in uniform. So we also, we, we absolutely have to hold people accountable when it comes to training. And if they can't uh, adhere to the standards of any kind of law enforcement training, and they need to go find something else to do in life because this isn't compromisable for when it comes to people's sacred things. So uh, good point, Chief. And again, congratulations. I didn't know you played for the Titans. Yeah, just to follow up on that, uh, Sheriff, I, don't, I can't believe you didn't notice those biceps on this profile picture. <laughs> <You had to be laughs> they're, cut off, they're cut off on my screen. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, to follow up on that really quick is the right. I mean, we have to find ways to get those old or officers to understand um, whether it's placement or whatever the case may be, make them feel part of the process. But at the end of the day, we are responsible for a service to the community and we have to find ways. Um, the workforce has changed from what it is today than what it was yesterday. And in order to be successful, we have to adopt. And our employees also have to adopt to change. And if they can't adopt to change, then we can't provide the service. So um, it's critical that we find ways to do that. There's no magic answer to that. To answer the caller's uh, question, I, 
there's no foolproof program that you're going to take a 35-year veteran and have him drink the Kool-Aid that the, the latest and greatest thing is, is the way to police. It's very difficult. So every situation is different. Unfortunately, I don't think this panel or any panel can provide an exact answer to that. Oh my goodness, gentlemen, I could go on. I've got at least another six or seven questions here. I I wish I could ask you, but we are just simply out of time. Charles, I'd like to turn to you for the for the last word, if you'd like to share a few last thoughts. Absolutely. Uh, very quickly, Major Wise, Sheriff Gonzalez, and, and Chief Scott, if you could just summarize for us just a final takeaway idea for our audience about community policing, as a lot of our audience members are going forward, what's one thing that they should take away from our conversation today? Major Wise, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Sheriff Gonzalez and Chief Scott. Right. So thank you for the opportunity. And I think the one thing that everyone should take away um, is, you know, community policing means transparency, being a part of the community. They've heard today from many different strategies on how to accomplish that. Every community is different. But if you expose your agency to the community, then that is a good start to community policing. Thank you, Major Wise. Sheriff Gonzalez, we'll go to you now. So to me, it's really about bringing people together. And so for me, anything that's good uh, brings people together. I think that tears them apart. That's why I was raised as evil. So the, to bring the community together and, and the betterment uh, for the greater good of, of the citizens that you live amongst is, is always going to be a positive thing. I would uh, tell people that when you're a head of agency, we're no different than any other person. I think uh, the chief illustrated that very well about his family life and what have you. And I'm no more than the servant. And hopefully that will fulfill the, the service to the people and protecting the most sacred things and be good listeners and good stewards of their rights by listening to them and figuring out what they need and making policies and creating a culture within your organization that is community centric. And if you do that, you can be successful in any part of the country in any organization, regardless of you have one person on your department or whether you have 20,000 people in your department. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Gonzalez. And last but not least, Chief Scott, I'll ask you to bring us home. Wow, the pressure. No, um, uh, thank you all for this opportunity. Um, it, it's, it's good for me. Every day I, I wake up and I try to learn from others. And I can tell you, I've learned a lot from you all, uh, you as well, Charles. And I can I, I just want to tell you all, when it comes to community policing and it comes to um, um, the best way to, to interact, ask questions, you know, um, ask questions when appropriate. You know, maybe not when we're in the middle of a traffic stop or dealing with the situation, but you know what? Get with your officers and talk to them. Uh, we're humans. We'll answer those questions. Something I see all the time is, is, is adults telling their children, you know, that officer's going to take you to jail or if you act bad or whatever. That's not the case. Uh, it starts with our youth. You know, the next generation of, of, of children are going to be the servants and, and the heroes that, that protect me when I'm old and in a, in, a, in a home somewhere, right? I ask that you all remember that, one, we are just like you. Um, we have been called to serve in, in our capacity, and we're very thankful and blessed to do this job because, one, it does provide for us, but also there's nothing more fulfilling when you lay down in bed at night knowing that you were able to help someone in their rough spot. And so I would encourage you all just to keep that mindset that we are no different, we are no better. Our job just comes with certain duties and responsibilities, and we are going to fulfill those to the best of our abilities. And I would encourage you all to continue educating yourself um, and educating your, your, your officers, because this is a group effort. We all are in this together, and, and that's the only way we can do it, and focus on the heart. If you get to the heart of a person, I think you can win them over, and that's our goal in our agency, and I know across the country with our sheriff and our major here is, is to, to reach them at that personal level. So thank you all. Well, Chief Scott, Sheriff Gonzalez, and Major Wise, a big thank you to you for participating today and sharing all of this great information for our audience. Chris, a big thank you to you for bringing in questions from the audience, and a very big thank you to all of our law enforcement agencies who joined from an audience member perspective today. We hope this has been valuable for you and thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Charles. Right. With that, this concludes today's Justice Clearinghouse webinar. Have a super rest of your day, everybody, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye now.